two. Sorry about that. Let's go back to um, where we left off on Monday. We were talking a little bit about creation as a concept that, um, that developed in order to overcome the obstacles, the differences between, between one human and another human. Right? And we talked about how the concept of toleration was a terrific concept, a wonderful concept that has done a lot of good but is, is, is limited in, uh, in, its stat, in its stature, right? I mean, the concept of toleration gets us somewhere, but not really, in my opinion, far enough, right? So toleration is based on a kind of, ultimately, a kind of dislike, right? And it doesn't give us the basis for forming really affirmative bonds between people, right? So I want to introduce two more concepts um, that are included under the rubric of the human, that uh, I think push us a little further toward that affirmative bond. And the first concept is the imagination or uh, the imagination specifically tailored to notions of utopia. And I know uh, because I've talked to um, your humanities professors, I know that you've been talking a little bit about the concept of utopia, right? Uh, which means in Greek either, either no place or good place. Right? And it's not clear which. Um, but the, 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 for our purposes, the importance is that these are, these are places that exist mostly within our imaginations. And utopia isn't discussed all that much in the context of human rights, but I think it's crucial. It's crucial to understand that one of the things that humans can do, remember on Monday we talked about efforts to think about what humans do that other either organic or inorganic entities cannot do, right? So humans have souls, humans have reason, humans have certain kinds of bodies that are different from, say, the bodies of plants. Um, and I want you now to consider the fact that humans have imagination, and that's really, really important. And one of the things that humans use their imagination for is to think about new worlds, new ways of living. And I think human rights falls under that, um, that, that rubric. So from, uh, from Plato's Republic to Thomas More's Utopia to Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, which was a novel that was written in 1887 and the full title was actually um, Looking Backward, 1887 to 2000. So um, for Edward Bellamy, the year 2000 was in the unimaginable future, right? And he talks, he creates this, um, to my mind, somewhat unpleasant world <laughs> that is for him a kind of perfect world, a utopia in the year 2000. Um, utopias have long been thought to carry the seeds of ideological change, right? People think about these things because they want to go there. They want to live in those places, right? They want to push society toward those places. In these utopias, authors have dreamed up new worlds and new societies in which people act virtuously toward each other and form societies based on the appreciation of positive human qualities, qualities like charity, curiosity, and intelligence. In Edward Bellamy's novel, the one that I just mentioned, Bellamy imagines a world in the year 2000 in which everyone has plenty to eat, and they all eat in public kitchens which are lovely, by the way. <laughs> Clean, luxurious, beautiful. Um, and technological innovations have eliminated the suffering, in particular, of factory workers, right? Because when Edward Bellamy, an American author, wrote in 1887, things were really, as you know, uh, pretty bleak for the average working human. Um, most jobs were in factories, and they were very, 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 very bad. Um, what lay behind Bellamy's vision, and this is crucial to note, something that didn't really come up 
in Monday's lecture, right, um, was a socialist view of society. So I want you also to consider the fact that, uh, that there, were, there were many different forms of ideologies that entered into the vision of utopia, right, including uh, socialism and fascism and utilitarianism. So not all utopias and not all imaginations go in the right direction, right? Um, nevertheless, they're very important things to, to, to think about. So a view that and socialism was extremely important, actually, to the development of human rights in many, many ways, especially uh, in the 19th century and through the early part of the 20th century. It helped a great deal to improve living conditions for the poor and for workers all over the world, and I think deserves a place in, in, uh, in any presentation on the development of human rights. Okay, in, in turning your attention to um, the genre of utopia, I've deliberately steered our conversation a little bit of human rights, a little bit toward literature. And so I hope to emphasize, again, these qualities that, in addition to the ones we mentioned on Monday, these qualities of being able to make things up, right, like literature, like stories, um, that help us to think not only rationally, right, not only with our reason, but beyond our reason, to think, in this case, specifically, imaginatively, and to think about a better future. I want to end these initial comments, and so we're still working with the human here, I want to end these comments with one more human attribute that I think is worth mentioning under the rubric of human rights, and that is what we call empathy. The ability to feel another person's pain or pleasure, I might add, right? Empathy, it's crucial. I think perhaps the most crucial. And I, I, want, I just want to be clear, I want to distinguish empathy from sympathy, right? So um, both are great, <laughs> both are terrific. Uh, sympathy is also from the Greek pathos, right? Both are from the Greek pathos, which means to feel or feeling, right? And sympathy, the prefix sim means with. So to sympathize is to feel alongside someone, to feel for them. But again, the actual, the operative function of the word sympathy is to feel your difference from someone, right? So you have to begin by feeling your difference in order to feel your likeness or your sameness from someone, right? So it's a wonderful thing to sympathize with someone. Empathy is, takes it one step further, right? Empathy is the feeling from, right? You feel as if you were someone else. You really, really understand. And the way I want to describe empathy, well, first I want to talk about um, how important empathy is for, for, uh, for human rights. You might be asking yourselves, so what does empathy have to do with human rights? A lot. Um, uh, according to the, to the historian Lynn Hunt, who is a famous historian of the French Revolution, the peculiar ability to f of humans to feel for each other um, that made the revolutions of the late 18th century, in particular, the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789, and I might add to that the Haitian Revolution of 1794, uh, made those things possible, believe it or not. Empathy, as Hunt points out, has always existed, right? And actually, recently, scientists now have located exactly where empathy exists. I'm not sure exactly, but it's somewhere in here. And they've located the spot, right? Uh, but even before they knew where it was, it was always around. Um, and Hunt ties empathy's role into the development of, of human rights to the rise, guess what, of the novel in the late 18th century, right? So in, in her argument, the novel plays an enormously important role in not in creating empathy, because it's always been there, but in bringing empathy into a very, very visible focus for people. Why? Because in reading the early novels, right, and I think we still do this today, but in reading especially the early novels, which were made largely out of fictional letters, right, they were called epistolary novels, right, um, readers were encouraged to really, really, really feel for the characters, right? And you can imagine yourselves what, why that would be, right? That epistolary novels, novels made up of fictional letters, invite the reader more than any other kind of novel, arguably, into 
into responding, right? I mean, when you, if you've ever read a novel made up of letters, right, you kind of feel like, you know, if you read a letter, you feel like, well, I think I might write back, right? I might write a letter back to that, to that writer, that fictional writer within that fictional novel. And so, so there, there's, there's a way in which empathy kind of comes to the surface in these epistolary novels. And according to Hunt, it's not a coincidence that they do, right? Um, and so I wanted to point to one novel uh, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, his novel Julie, which he wrote in 1761. So it was, uh, it was uh, an early, a very early version of the novel. And if you're curious, other very early epistolary novels um, include Samuel Richardson's Pamela and his Clarissa, huge book, but well worth the read. Um, and, uh, and Julie, and then there, there were a bunch, uh, Field, Henry Fielding, who didn't write epistolary novels, but was an early novelist, along with Daniel Defoe. And a lot of these novels are really pitched toward this sense of, um, of empathy. OK, um, the in, in very, very gross kind of generalization and simplification, um, these early epistolary novels were largely about women who were forced to do things to varying degrees that they didn't want to do. Um, and in Julie's case, to marry someone she doesn't, doesn't love. In Clarissa's case, actually, far worse, she was forced uh, to succumb to a rape and then died uh, alone and miserable. And Pamela's an exception because in Pamela, actually, the story ends well. She, she is uh, seduced, but she marries her, um, her masters. Readers of all kind reacted very strongly to these novels, right? Empathically to these novels. And from all classes, from all classes, from all socioeconomic brackets, right? And they actually wrote to the author, um, they wrote many letters to the author, to Rousseau in this case, to tell him that after reading Julie, they couldn't sleep at night, they couldn't stop crying, right? They couldn't eat. And here we see, this is actually this, this message to Rousseau, was from a soldier, right? Someone you wouldn't think that would, would, would have this kind of reaction to a sentimental novel, right? And this guy wrote to Rousseau, you have driven me crazy about her, that is Julie. Imagine then the tears that her death must have wrung from me. Never have I wept such delicious tears. That reading created such a powerful effect on me that I would have gladly died during that supreme moment, right? Um, so this was someone who was really very, very affected by this, by this novel, and not alone, right? So these and similar reactions, it seems to me, suggest that people were finding ways of imagining themselves in others' lives. What could be a better basis for human rights, right? For understanding how important it is to see everyone is deserving of the same kind of, of equal treatment. Through empathy, you learn to recognize yourself in someone you are not. That's, a, that's big, that's huge, right? Take a second and think about that. Seems easy, but it's not. And this, it seems to me, is one of the most profitable things we can do as humans. There's a, uh, there's a kind of cliche uh, in English, I'm sure you have a Turkish version, to explain uh, what empathy really is, right? And when we, we talk about it in this cliched way, we say it's like being in someone else's shoes, right? Being in someone else's shoes. So, um, to check not. Um, so here's, a, here's an image of, uh, of it's kind of silly, but it's, it's, it's sort of cute at the same time of what it might mean to step into someone else's shoes. I want to stay with the concept for a second. If on Monday we looked at the ways in which humans have tried over the centuries to identify a series of attributes that make humans what they are, we need now to see whether these attributes are plausible foundations for rights. And conversely, how rights connect with the things that make us human, if that, if that makes sense, right? What do humans have to do with rights and what do rights have to do with humans? As I suggested on Monday, when I explained why I split the lectures up in terms of the human on Monday and rights today, um, what we see is that rights and humans are not 
it's, it's not a, a natural pairing. It's not a match made in heaven, right? Uh, which is why we're, we're still struggling. We struggle with human rights, right? Um, you, can't, you can't miss that. Um, to say that, to say what it is that connects all humans together is definitely not to say, by definition, that people have the rights to those things. So let's break down what rights are for a bit. So what we discovered on Monday was that humans have certain things. They have souls, they have reason, they have empathy, they have a conscience, right? That not only make them different from other living things, but also make them long for all humans to have those things. So it's actually fairly complex, right? There's an intrinsic desire within us uh, to, to have other people feel okay, right? It doesn't always work out that way, but it seems to be there. But how do we move from that desire, that feeling, that innate feeling, our ability to empathize, how do we move from that to rights? How do we translate those things into rights in the first place? We need to talk about what a right is. A right, according to some philosophers, is a legal, social, or ethical entitlement to be able to do something, or, depending on the situation, not to do something. Let me say that again. It is a legal, social, or ethical entitlement either to do something or not to do something, depending on the situation. But when philosophers define rights in this way, they neglect to separate about the difference between social and ethical and legal, right? Social, ethical on the one hand, legal on the other. So I want to do a little bit of that today. It's true that the first efforts to ensure that humans would be treated fairly were based on ideas about what we now call natural rights, rights that derive from nature, from our bodies, from our biology, that we all, again, to go back to what we were talking about on Monday, that we all have bodies and souls, brains and reason, imagination and empathy. But we just have these things, right? Again, I want you to see, I want you to see that there's a gap between the human and rights. We need to get there. We need to bridge it. How do we get there? Many, of course, have argued that these attributes were given to us originally by God. And that's an answer. That's one plausible answer. That's how we get from the human, from what it is that we have, to rights, right? It's God-given. It's God-given. If it's God-given, then everyone should have it, right? There's an authority to which we can appeal. But there have been numerous problems with this, right? <laughs> Needless to say, um, the idea that there is a God or that, there, that everyone has the same God is, of course, very problematic. Um, and when the significance of a godhead, right, began to wane in the Enlightenment and was replaced in many ways by science and reason, right, people felt the urge, the need, to come up with different formulations for the notion of rights. The first and foremost uh, efforts in this regard were made by people, again, during the American and French revolutions, during the Enlightenment that we were discussing. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on Monday, but today we'll look a little more closely at how the framers of these documents that emerged during this period thought about rights. So here we have um, Thomas Paine's, one of Thomas Paine's comments. Thomas Paine was a, a British, uh, soon to become American, and then soon to become French. He flitted around all over the world. Um, was kind of a persona non grata, wasn't really, made a lot of trouble wherever he went. Uh, he's a troublemaker. Um, no one really liked him, but we like him now because he wrote these fabulous, fabulous things. Um, and he wrote a pamphlet during the, uh, during the American Revolution that fed directly into the Declaration of Independence. It was written the same year, and it was called Common Sense, right? And for Payne, that summed it up. That summed it up. Why do we have rights? Why do we have human rights? It's just common sense, right? It just makes perfect common sense that we have rights. Paine argued that the American colonies should be independent of Great Britain because it made sense. <laughs> so his major arguments rested, not surprisingly, on easily understood metaphors usually drawn from nature. So, right, so he points out, for instance, that Great Britain was much, literally, much smaller than the colonies. Here's England, here are the colonies, right? So he writes, 
In no instance hath nature made the satellite larger than its primary planet. And as England and America, with respect to each other, re reverses the common order of nature, right, because the smaller is in charge of the bigger, it is evident they belong to different systems. England to Europe, America to itself. <laughs> right. So I want you just to, 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 um, to go back in time and kind of put your minds back there and, and imagine um, why I might be laughing. It makes perfect sense, right? Um, but he's arguing this enormous revolutionary idea, right? But he argues it as if it were just, meh, you know, yeah. It, it just, it's just logical, right? Common sense. So that's why we have these rights. He also used the metaphor of child development to counter arguments by people who said that America was England's child, and that was the common metaphor, right? America was, was the child of England. They called England the mother country, right? And couldn't be capable of standing on its own. We may as well assert, he said, that because a child has thrived upon milk, that it is never to have meat. So when you're, when you're just starting out in life, newborn, all you can stomach is milk. It's all you need, right? But he argues that it's as if you were to say, oh, well, milk, that's all you guys should be having all day long, right? Milk, all day long. Um, America should always stay a child. And that's clearly not the case. I'm guessing you, you probably have a few other things other than, than milk during the day. The rhetorical force of Paine's commonsensical metaphors was greater than I can even begin to say. For he was capable of changing the meaning of words entirely, turning the concept of independence, for example, which had formerly been an undesirable quality. It wasn't a good thing to be, to, to be, to be called independent, right? In, in the 16th, 17th century, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th. Uh, it wasn't okay to be called independent. It meant you didn't care about other people. It meant that you, were, that you, didn't, that you didn't have dependence, right? That you weren't part of a community. And all of a sudden, with a little pushing, right? Pain and others, he didn't do it single-handedly, but pain and others create a, new, a completely new meaning, right? So it wouldn't even cross our minds today that it's not good to be independent. We all strive for a certain form of independence, right? That's how powerful language can be. A, another term, a, a much more problematic term, that grew up alongside the notion of common sense was self-evidence, right? For Thomas Jefferson, famously, the rights of humans to freedom and equality were self-evident. Why do we have rights? Always ask yourself that question. Why are there human rights? Oh, it's self-evident, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Similarly, although they don't use the term self-evident as such, the framers of the Declaration of the Rights of Man during the French Revolution made the same claims. This declaration read in part, the representatives of the French people organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole cause of public calamities, have determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, unalienable, and sacred rights of man, in order that the grievances of the citizens based hereafter upon simple and incontestable principles shall tend to the maintenance of the Constitution and were down to the happiness of all. So these are, they don't use the word self-evident, but they kind of do, right? Words like natural, unalienable, incontestable, they make the same point. And another version of the same idea, the Marquis de Lafayette says, dire ce que tout le monde sait, ce que tout le monde sent, right? But that's what human rights are. What the world, what everyone in the world knows, what everyone in the world feels. Well, think about those, think about all those statements, right? Think about self-evidence, think about that, right? What does it mean to say that things are self-evident, right? According to one scholar of the Declaration of Independence and of Jefferson's writings as a whole, Quote, the insistence on self-evidence paradoxically demands both embodiment, that you are a self, the self as self, and disembodiment, that you are simply evidence, right? So you look at me, am I 
evidence of who I am or am I who I am? It's, it's, it's hard to say there's a contradiction there, there's a paradox. But even, even more sort of tragically in some sense, right? what you want to say about self-evidence is if it's so self-evident, why talk about it at all? Right? It's what everyone knows, as the Marquis de Lafayette said, it's what everyone knows, it's what everyone feels. Well, one answer I would argue is because that's really not the case. Right? Things are not as self-evident as everyone uh, has always assumed. The equal qualities we have attributed to humans or found to be inherent in humans um, that may or may not entitle them to liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness need to be talked about. They need to be talked about a lot. More importantly, they need to be contained and protected because despite the internal inconsistencies of the concept of self-evidence, our constant wars and struggles prove definitively that not everyone agrees that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are good things, or alternatively, that they can be achieved in the same way. It turns out that human rights, though a natural part of what humans are, need the same kind of support and protection that other rights and principles need, the law. Rights, in fact, could be argued, uh, it could be argued are entirely a legal phenomenon. Although people have said that rights can be natural, the notion of rights, I would suggest, is not natural by definition. Rights, it could even be said, are not exactly human in the sense that we have been discussing. One way to think about rights is that for one person to have a right, another person must be deprived of one. Let's say, for example, I have a right to walk freely wherever I choose, right? I do. I have a right to walk freely wherever I choose. So I take a walk on the beach one day, and I'm feeling especially free and rights conscious. I'm walking along thinking I have a right to walk freely. I'm not looking at the beach or the water or smelling the air. I'm just thinking, this is cool. I have a right to walk freely. But toward the end of the beach, I reach a fence. There's a fence there and I can't walk anymore. My right to walk freely has been abridged, just like that. I either have to find an alternative way of walking past or around the fence, or I have to turn around. Those are my options. I could, of course, complain about this to my friends. I could complain loudly and tell them that my walk was spoiled. But could I take this to court? Could I take that abridgment of my right to walk freely wherever I choose? to court, it depends, right? And, that's, and that's, the, that's really, that's it. I could stop there. It depends, right? That's the complexity of rights, right? There's never an easy answer to rights. If the fence is on the beach because someone else owns that section of the beach, then no, I can't go to court, right? Because why? Because that person has a right to own that section of the beach, right? That's a right to private property. And so my right is curtailed. So rights typically, although not exclusively, are rights as against others. Not all rights look like this, but many do. Take the right to free speech, one of the most essential rights to emerge from the Enlightenment era. It doesn't seem at first like this is a right that could actually impinge on anyone, right? I can speak freely whenever I want about anything I choose. But if I say something, and, someone, and no one has to listen to me, by the way, right? I can go into a room, close the door, and speak freely. I can even shout at the top of my lungs. Everyone has the right to do that, right? But, but if someone else happens to hear you, and they can't avoid hearing you for some reason, for instance, like you're screaming, right? That has the potential for violating someone else's right to be free of that kind of speech, right? And this is exactly what's happening in certain, in certain kinds of hate speech cases in the United States and elsewhere at this time. Even those of us who have the right to free speech can't use that right to utter racial epithets when referring to other people, right? Or to make insidious claims about other people uh, based on their gender or their race or other protected categories. So your right to free speech, it's, it's fabulous, right? But there's a limit because other people have a right not to hear your, you speak freely all the time if you're speaking freely in certain ways. 
So one of the problems with rights is that these examples suggest that people, too often, I think, assume that rights are absolute. They, they, they want to say that they have them all the time and purely. This was a particular problem historically for various groups, including women, who in the late 18th century were new to rights discourse and often misunderstood how rights worked. So I take an example here to show you this from a wonderful novel. Many of you may have read it, or you will soon be reading it in, um, in your literature courses, uh, by Kate Chopin called The Awakening. It was written in 1899, right at the cusp of the 19th century. And in this novel, a woman named Edna Pontelier finds herself in her late 20s, and she's unhappily married to a man who is domineering. And she's the mother of two small children, whom she loves, but also resents. Right? Why? Because they get in the way of her having her right to do whatever she wants, whenever she wants to. Right? She wants to walk. She wants to swim. She wants to, to eat. She wants to paint. Whatever it is, she's got these two little kids. Right? The novel tells the story of Edna's coming of age and how she successfully escapes her unhappy marriage. But she finds herself unable to escape her kids. Toward the end of the novel, she meets an old friend who asks harmlessly about her vacation plans. The friend asks, and are you going abroad? Right? This doesn't sound like too threatening a question, right? But for Edna, it brings up a whole range of very, very tragic and confused emotions. And Edna replies, perhaps, no, I am not going. I'm not going to be forced into doing things. I don't want to go abroad. I want to be let alone. Nobody has any right, except children perhaps. And even then, it seems to me, or it did seem, and then she trails off, right? She can't quite put it together, right? Edna's problem, or at least one of her problems, the novel, I, 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 I will, I, I'm giving you a spoiler, but you're not gonna read it for the story, right? You're gonna read it for the quality of the language, right? And images. She does commit suicide in the end, so she's got many problems, right? Um, but one of them is that she misunderstands the nature of rights. Uh, for I think, I think we would all agree, probably, after a moment or two of thought, right, that it's rarely the case that nobody has any right um, to, and for Edna that means what? To ask you to do something, to make you do something, right? It's not the case that nobody has any right, so she's got it wrong. There are obviously a great variety of rights, right? I mean, this is a very, very small sampling of the number of rights we have, right? And, not, and these are not human rights, necessarily. Some are, right? But some are not. A right to asylum is a human right. Um, but not all of these are rights. But you can see that this is just a sampling of the number of rights that people have talked about over time, right? And we, we often, we need to choose among them. Take, for example, the negative right embodied in two of the Ten Commandments from the Hebrew Bible. The first thou shalt not steal. This is a reminder that we all have a right to private property. Right? And the second, thou shalt not murder. This is a reminder that we all have a right to stay alive. But what happens when the two come into conflict? Suppose a shoplifter enters a music store on East Cross Street and puts a CD of a rock band that he really likes into his pocket. As he starts to leave the store without paying, the shopkeeper calls after him and says, you know, hey, come back, return that. And the shoplifter doesn't respond, so the shopkeeper tries to tackle him. And then he pulls a gun, uh, because he has a license to carry that gun for some reason, and he shoots him dead. How do we understand this in terms of rights? If both rights are valid, that of the shopkeeper to be free of theft and that is a right the shopkeeper has, and that of the shoplifter to be free of murder, right, then it seems that we need to choose between them, and that's problematic in and of itself. In practice, of course, under most systems of law, the right to be free of murder trumps, that is to say it's bigger and better 
than the right to be free of theft. And the shopkeeper would almost certainly be found guilty of some wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that the shoplifter was doing the right thing, it just means that the shopkeeper was doing something really bad, even worse. The situation, however, would change if the shoplifter were threatening the shopkeeper with a gun or a knife himself, right? And then the right to be free of murder on the part of the shoplifter would clash with the same right on the part of the shopkeeper. And the person who was doing the threatening would be found guilty of wrongdoing, right? So it, we come back to that answer, right? It depends. The point of all this is not to decide these cases, right? Um, or not even to try to decide how a court of law might decide these cases. But to make us think about two things. One, how complex rights are, and two, how difficult it is to claim and maintain them. It's true that human rights are not exactly the same as the rights we've just been discussing, but they do function in many similar ways. And this is partly why the struggles from peaceful to the violent, right, have accompanied great rights movements um, from the Enlightenment, uh, before the Enlightenment to, uh, to today. It's worth, even as we acknowledge how complex rights are, to acknowledge also how powerful rights discourse is, right? And, and so I, I want you to think about how difficult they are, but how fabulously wonderful uh, they are at the same time. Try to keep those ideas in your head at the same time. Rights and the claim to rights have led many groups of people who have not been adequately recognized to gain some sort of recognition. The 19th century in particular was marked by the claim for human rights by people all over the world, by blacks, by women, by workers, by indigenous people, by children, by advocates for children. Mary Wollstonecraft and, whoops, there she is, Mary Wollstonecraft in England Mary, and Margaret Fuller in America led the campaign for women's rights, although from very different angles. For Wollstonecraft, and I, 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 I think I, I was informed, uh, I think I remember that, that you've also read some Wollstonecraft, right? For Wollstonecraft, the project was largely to rid their, women of their, independ of their, excuse me, of their dependence on sentiment. Right? So, so Wollstonecraft um, wrote things that tried to get women uh, to, to move on, right? to gain the same kind of basis for reason that men had. Right? And uh, again, in the interest of time, I won't read this quote, but I'll have you look at it. For Margaret Fuller, um, the task was not only to educate women to be the equals of men through their use of reason, which was what Wollstonecraft was after as well, but also to use their feelings. So Fuller was, she was, she, was, uh, she was able to accommodate the idea, and she used the word intuition, actually. And instead of making that a kind of uh, criticism of women, she said it was a great thing, right? That women had this, she called it electricity, right? Um, that, uh, that, that gave them an equality, if not a kind of superiority. Drawing on the accomplishments of these and many other rights advocates, women in many places have made gains around the world. And I should mention, uh, since I am here in Istanbul, that Turkey is one of the most extraordinary places uh, where women have, have made great strides. In the 1930s, Turkey became one of the first countries in the world to give political rights to women, including the right to elect and be elected, both locally and nationally. Article 10 of the Turkish Constitution bans discrimination, state or private, on the grounds of sex. Similarly, the 19th century saw the rise of a rights movement for black people, at first to liberate them from slavery, based on their essential humanity, and second, to secure them the same rights white people had, to vote, to own property, to marry. Movements to free slaves and accord them equal rights have been going on for centuries, from the time of ancient Egypt to the present day. And um, this is a picture, as you can see, a famous, famous photograph of some black men sitting at a lunch counter uh, in the south of the United States where they had been banned, right? You were not allowed to sit at lunch counters, and these were called, uh, commonsensically, lunch counter protests or sit-ins. In the 20th century, we've seen rights claims by many more groups of this kind, by gay people, transgender people, and the disabled, among others. Just as there were revolutions at the end of the 18th century in France, Haiti, and America, there were a series of revolutions in the 1960s that led to great reforms in many countries. 
uh, and the civil rights movement in the, in the United States when, where those lunch sit-ins were happening was also um, late 50s through the 1960s, right? Here's a picture of um, some of the protests in Paris in 1968. Student protests brought about tremendous gains in education and sexuality. Similarly in Prague, there was a movement known as the Prague Spring in 1968. Uh, there were similar movements in Mexico and Australia, strikes going on all over the world. Fast forward a, a little bit to the 1990s, another crucial era for gains in human rights, um, the passage in America of the Americans with Disabilities Act was extraordinary. Um, and I, I, I lived through this change, and it wasn't just a change in people's awareness, it was a change in the built environment, in the landscape. So every public building has to have access for the disabled. And all of a sudden, there were all kinds of elevators being built, ramps, special bathrooms, you couldn't miss it, right? And it was an extraordinary change in the landscape. But listing the rights movements, the protests, the struggles, the marches, the sit-ins, the boycotts, the strikes that have led to many of the major changes in human rights across the globe doesn't mean that we can ignore the legal and institutional structures that have been used over time to advance human rights and to address human rights violations. So let's talk a little bit about those things that are put into place that make these things come true, right? The first and most powerful one, oh, and here's, I, I failed to mention, here's a picture of the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement in New York. Um, another movement that has, has gone global, right? Viral, you could say. Um, here's an image of the Magna Carta. You're not meant to read it, right? <laughs> it's too, way too small. Uh, one of the earliest contracts, simple contract, right? Something you can sit there right now in your chair, turn to your neighbor and say, um, how about, how about uh, we, we, uh, we go to lunch, uh, if you go to lunch with me, even though you're not hungry, you go to lunch with me, then afterwards I'll go to the movie with you. That's, that's kind of a contract, right? Something as simple as that. Well, contracts are really, really, really important. Um, and, and the Magna Carta is one of the very oldest ones. It's a great way to put, to bring people together. We can point to the Magna Carta and the Mayflower Compact as two of the earliest and greatest examples. What's great about these examples is the radical way they broke with the idea of the rule of force, rule, uh, rule by force extremely, or excuse me, or a coerced submission. In the Magna Carta, for example, which was written and signed by King John of England, in the early part of the 13th century. Um, not, a, not a terrific image, the resolution isn't very good, but you can see King John moving over to sign it, right? That there was, this was an image that they wanted repeated and reproduced all over the place. And it showed that there was consent, this consent being given, right? The king now signs this contract. Um, a group, in the Magna Carta, a group of noble barons, right? Uh, challenged for the first time the absolute authority of the king and in a significant number of cases worked to ensure that nobles and people of all ranks would be able to maintain their rights and complain about them if those rights were not, ex not respected. Okay, a similarly influential document that served as the basis for human rights was the Mayflower Compact, signed by the first white settlers uh, to arrive in Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts in the year 1620. The feature for our purposes, again, and uh, in the interest of time, I won't read it, but you can see that it's, it's, it's boilerplate, right? It just says, we, we, these people who have come here, agree to do good things, right? <laughs> I summarized it for you, right? Um, one of the most interesting things about the Mayflower Compact, bear with me for a sec, is not so much what it says, although that's pretty great, right? And you're not also not meant to read this, right? I give you this image. Um, to show you, this is it, that's the entire Mayflower Compact. Uh, the names are a little cut off, but look how much of the page is given over to the signatures. Just look how much of a third of the page, right? If not, something like a half, right? So contracts are fabulous, but again, there's a limitation, right? Remember we talked about the phrase, we the people, right? So here's a contract, but it belongs to these people right here, and they want to make that very clear, right? It belongs to those people and not others, right? And that's the problem, right? Um, 
It's a contract among certain people who have the power to ultimately exclude others. The contracts that were made in these early documents serve as the basis for extended social contracts between people of territorially identifiable places and the sovereigns of those places. For the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, in Leviathan, for instance, right? Um, people had to make contracts in order to go into society, right? The beginning of the social contract. Otherwise, he said it was a war of all against all. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as we talked about his novel Julie, he also wrote novels, he also wrote political tracts, right? Came up with the notion of the social contract in its entirety, and he followed on the heels of Hobbes and Locke and suggested that people needed to give up certain freedoms, certain rights, in order to gain others by moving into society together. Give me three more minutes. Um, after the rise of these great contracts uh, under the Enlightenment, we move again, we skip ahead to something like World War II and its aftermath, one of the greatest tragedies uh, in human history, and the rise of an international order, right? The rise of international contracts and the creation of internationalism as a whole with the creation of the UN in 1948. One of the first acts of the United Nations was to create the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We read a little bit of that on Monday, right? And one of the famous words and most important words in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is in its title, and that word is universal. Right? Now there's an effort to bring those small contracts between 12 people or 15 people or 100 people across the world, to make them universal. The United Nations did what it could to maintain this ambitious goal. And on December 10, 1948, 48 member nations, including Afghanistan, Lebanon, Greece, Liberia, Turkey, Iceland, Ethiopia, India, Iran, and Iraq adopted its principles. And there were conventions that were made, all kinds of conventions to supplement the United Nations, right? Conventions to prevent punishment and genocide and torture and to protect people to protect children, right, the rights of children, and to protect people from forced disappearances. So all these things have been done to, to supplement these universal rights, including the creation of the International Court of Justice in The Hague, right? So this course adjudicate, this court, excuse me, adjudicates problems from all over the world, from all over the world, as if there were an authority uh, to do that. The problem with the ICJ is that you have to subscribe, right? Um, its authority, again, is limited. There's always a problem, right? Um, and in fact, in the 1980s, when the ICJ decided that the United States had committed a covert war in Nicaragua, right, uh, that it was a violation of human rights to commit this war, the United States withdrew. So, so now the United States is, uh, uh, it, it subjects itself to the adjudication of the ICR whenever it wants to, on a case-by-case -case basis but ultimately no nation is forced to, um, to be there. <clears throat> the, one of the problems with, with, with rights is that they are, they are socially and culturally variable, right? Um, and here we have a statement by the foreign minister of Singapore, an unlikely person, I think, uh, to have made this statement, but, but a crucial speaker in this, uh, in this debate. Another way to put this, perhaps, is to say that human rights um, too often are confused with humanitarianism, the commitment by some nations to make other nations better. And, and there's a problem, there's a big problem with, right, that, with that. Humanitarianism under the banner of human rights has done untold good all over the globe. It's helped to stop wars, to liberate people suffering under tyrannical rule, to bring food and medicine to people in need. But as a practical way of bringing human rights into the world, it may need to be revised or supplemented. So people are turning back to more local solutions, right? Um, they're turning away from the discourse of rights, which is a discourse of someone as against the state, to slightly more local solutions. And my, my local solution 
along with many other people, including most famously perhaps Martha Nussbaum, one of the, one of the great uh, writers today about human rights and ethical problems of that sort, is education. I think we need to go back to a notion that alongside a rights discourse, which I don't think we should abandon in any way, right? it's fabulously important, I think we need to education, right? Because and when we educate people, we bring out those human qualities, the ability to empathize, for instance, um, because the more you know, the more you learn, the more you understand what's going on with other people. So I think we need to go back to school, right? And you're in a very good position because you are there. Um, and the more you learn and the more you can teach, that others can teach you, you can teach others. Uh, not just about human rights, about everything, because that's what ultimately leaves us with a sense of an expanded uh, rights discourse. So thanks so much for, for listening and being here. Thanks.